help me believe I can worship that kind of God. And what this story tells us is that doubt is an invitation to deepen the relationship with God. That when you doubt, you're called to go further, to explore. Doubt is good. The opposite of faith is certainty. Who needs faith if you're certain? It doesn't, doesn't make sense. The opposite of faith is certainty. What doubt is, is an opportunity for us to deepen our relationship with God because there needs to be a struggle. We have to think about things. We have to wonder about things. But I think the reason that so many people struggle with doubt and don't go anywhere with it is because they don't have the tools for the struggle. And the tools for the struggle in our tradition is scripture. Number one, we can go to the Bible. Tradition, what does the church say? What has the church said about whatever we're struggling with? Reason, God gave us a brain, we can use it. And then experience. Where have we experienced God? These are the questions that we can ask. And where is God in whatever situation we're experiencing doubt? So we have these tools, scripture, tradition, reason, and experience that we can go deeper in our doubt to find where God is. Everybody has moments of doubt. People experience a crisis of faith. I had one in my ordination process. Not a good thing. <laughs> I'm on my way to the priesthood. It's the last step is to do a chaplaincy at Strong. And I'm there at Strong, and what I'm supposed to be doing is praying for people. Well, I had spent my life in corporate America doing things, solving problems. I was paid to solve problems. Now I'm with people whose problems I cannot solve because they're sick or dying, and all I can do is pray. And I think, that's, that's not good. That's not doing anything. What good does prayer do? I don't think it does anything. I think it's just a platitude, a way to make people feel better for the moment. So I confessed this crisis of faith that I was having to my supervisor, fortunately, and he says, well, Julie, I think you should study prayer. So I did, and I have written about this. It's on the internet. Go to our website. I'll do a little commercial. You can find the book. I haven't put up this story. So my biggest crisis of faith that where I said, there is no God, or if there is a God, I'm not going to like this God. This is not the God I want to worship. Came one night when I was on call, and my pager went off, and I had to go to the eighth floor. Well, the eighth floor is where intensive care is. And I get up to the eighth floor. I don't know what's going on. And the nurse said, go see that woman with the little boy. So I went to see the woman with the little boy, and he's about five years old. And the woman said, ask the chaplain your question, honey. So I bend over, and I... I, I face to face with this little five-year-old and I go, well, what's your question? And he's crying, you know, and he stops crying and he looks at me and he goes, are there dinosaurs in heaven? <laughs> I missed that class. I don't know where I was, but when they were explaining about that, I was not in school. So having been a sales rep for 20 years, I qualified him. So I said, do you like dinosaurs? He goes, Yep. I said, are they good dinosaurs or bad dinosaurs? He goes, good dinosaurs. I said, okay, one more question. If you were in heaven, would you want the dinosaurs to be with you? And the kid goes, yeah. I said, oh, wait, of course. Yeah, they're in heaven. <laughs> they're all over heaven. <laughs> I had no idea what I was walking into. Well, as it turned out, his father had collapsed in a restaurant and he was, had three kids. He had a 15-year-old daughter, a 12-year-old son, and this five-year-old son, and he had collapsed in the restaurant and had had a brain aneurysm, apparently. And so they asked me if I would go into the room while they tested to see if he had any brain function. So I did, and he didn't. So we had to come out and tell the mother and her children that their, her husband was brain dead. It was one of those horrifying moments and, and you know you're looking into the faces of these young children and it just was brutal. Well the woman happened to be one of seven children and all six siblings lived in town and they came to the hospital with their spouses and their children and pretty soon there were 50 people 
all in deep grief and mourning and, and I'm trying to organize this crowd and I, I went right into my sales rep mode. I went over to the nurse. I said, we need a hospitality tray. Where can we put them in a room? And you know, we, so we, we kind of got everyone together and, and um, then of course the transplant team comes and says, you know, we're wondering if they'd be willing to donate the organs and like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I've got to go through all of this. And so in the middle of this, what are they, we, we, need to, we needed to pray. And so I'm leading the prayers and I'm thinking to myself, I can't worship this God that has taken this man and why couldn't someone, you know, someone 104 have a brain aneurysm? I can't, I can't deal with this and what is prayer going to do? And so here I am in the midst of my doubt, but Jesus shows up anyway because that's what Jesus does when you're in the midst of doubt. So we pray and the whole atmosphere changed. People calmed down. There was this, this sense of, of holiness with this group of people. And we spent a couple hours deciding whether or not the family wanted to donate the organs. And so they did. They donated the organs. And I had to take the children in to say goodbye to their father. One of the hardest moments of my ministry well, the next morning, I'm telling all the other chaplains, because I was up all night doing things about this, and I'm crying through report, and I'm saying, I can't believe God did this, and where is God in this, and prayer doesn't work, and I can't find God, and if there is a God, then I can't stand this God, because he took away this father, and I, I'm just a mess. And so, after report, my supervisor says, you need to go back up on the floor to the cancer ward. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> So I'm walking down the hall, and this is before cell phones, and there's a bank of phones. So I decide to call my husband to rant and rave to him. And I dial all his numbers, I can't find him, and uh, I, I'm noticing there's a woman next to me on the phone. And I, I'm thinking to myself, I don't know where God was in all of this, and I don't think there's, there's, where is God? And all of a sudden, I hear the woman next to me say, she's crying, she's got three little kids, she goes, a man came in last night and died of a brain aneurysm and my husband got his liver and he's gonna make it. It's like, whoa, okay God, <laughs> I get it. <laughs> it. In the midst of my horrifying doubt, what it did was help me figure out a theology I could live with, that, that God doesn't necessarily control the biology of what's happening inside of people but what God does is take a bad situation, the worst possible situation, and make the best possible thing come out of it. That through the prayers that we had said enabled the family to donate the organs, and in donating the organs enabled this man who had three little kids to live because he had received the liver. Seven people got organs from this man, heart, lungs, Two piece, one piece of his liver went to a little girl, one went to a, a man, uh, both kidneys. Seven lives were saved. There was resurrection with this person. And the family had, was very hesitant in the beginning about donating, but it was through prayers that they donated. And then six months later at the, at the donation banquet where families come together who have donated um, their loved one's organs and the people who have received them, they come together. I was the the opening prayer at that banquet and they came together and they met each other and they experienced resurrection. In the midst of doubt we're invited to go deeper. We're invited to rant and rave at God. We're invited to say to God, I don't believe unless and God shows up. Jesus comes and says, go ahead, touch some way. But we, we come together in community because we can miss it. We can miss where God is. We need each other to point it out. I was in a community of people who were helping me see what, what prayer could do. Community is so important. We come together because maybe we doubt we can keep the church going in economic troubled times. We might be, feel crazy because we want to put a new roof on the church. We, we don't know. We're, we come together because maybe we doubt we can do something about world hunger, but by gosh, we can pledge a buck to the bishop and walk in Tinker Park. Out of our doubt, we go deeper. And for that, we give thanks. Amen.